you Romans chapter 8. I want you to look with me, if you will, in verse number 1. He said, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of, spirit, uh, for the, law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that, in, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit, by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You need to remember that one for sure. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I want you to look with me in verse number 35 where he said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distresses or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Let me say this right fast. He promised us every bit of that. He promised us, if you're saved, he promised us every bit of that right there. The men he told uh, that was following him, he told them, look, the world's going to hate you. Uh, you're going to be persecuted, and some of you is going to die. And every one of them he told that to died a martyr's death with exception of one. So he did promise us these things, but he said, who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things uh, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, I pray you'd help us tonight. As we preach the word of God, I pray you'd open up the hearts to the hearers. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us, Heavenly Father, uh, just be able to speak something that's going to help somebody grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to try to preach to you tonight on one of the greatest subjects, I think, in the Bible, and that is the, the doctrine of eternal security. Uh, now, look, we're, we're Baptists, and we believe in the doctrine of eternal security. And uh, he makes it very clear in this passage of Scripture. He covers a number of things, but I want to just focus on one. But verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He said in verse number 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing. We should have got our fill when before we got saved, and we are in debt to it no more. And uh, he tells us that if we feed the flesh, he said in the very next verse, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Hebrews 12 deals with the doctrine of chastisement. 
And he said, we're all partakers of that. And he said, if we're not partakers of that, then we're bastards and not sons. So he said, every child of God, somewhere along the way, is going to be taken to the woodshed. Some a little bit more serious than others, but if you're saved, trust me, you're just like any child that's ever been born into this world, you're going to need a whipping every once in a while. Amen? There's never been a child so kind that didn't need a good uh, correcting every once in a while. Amen? And we all know that as, as nice and as good and as great as our kids are, we've had to whip them. He said he would do that for us, and he said there's no condemnation when you walk in Christ Jesus, not after the flesh. But if you walk in the flesh, and you feed the flesh, and it is a possibility. That's another message in another time concerning your flesh. Romans seven eighteen said, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which uh, he said, I find not. He said, look, I want to live for God. I want to do what's right, but my wicked flesh sometimes gives in. Amen. He told his disciples, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is willing, but the flesh is weak. Never, ever trust your flesh. Like we preached this morning in the passage, we preached to have no confidence in the flesh. If you do, you are going to fail. Amen? And you will wind up in trouble, but 15 times in this chapter, the word in is used. And uh, it's an amazing thing about this word in. And what I want to focus on is found down in these chapters, or in this chapter. Uh, just, I guess, by way of introduction, I, I heard this story told one time, and I thought it was a great story. It really kind of opened up the truth about eternal security. And uh, uh, we all know about the Golden Gate Bridge. I heard this guy telling this story. It was built in 1937, and it cost $77 million to build that bridge. Now, today it'd probably be much, much more than that. But the first section, there was 23 men that fell to their death. Uh, because the bridge was so high, these men were terrified up there working. Now, you would have never got me up there in the first place, but there's where they were at. No safety harnesses and stuff like that, but 23 of them fell to their death, and it was so high that those men, just from the fear of falling, what would happen, uh, they, they'd be overly cautious, and they would fall to their death. Well, that's what they told the people, that the engineers of the bridge. So what the engineers did is they, they spent $100,000 on a net uh, to, for these men that was under them. And so what those men did is that only 10 fell on the second half, uh, half of that bridge. None of them died. And they, they said that production went up 25% on the second half of that bridge because those men, they didn't have the fear of falling anymore. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's the way we are. We can't sit around and have the fear of falling. Matter of fact, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, you need to read verses 4 through 10. talks about them exceeding great and precious promises. But verse 10 says that if you do these things... Ye shall never fall. That is a promise from God Almighty. If you'll do what he said in that list, he said you're never going to fall. So if we fall and falter and fail, you know what it is? It's not God's fault or anybody else's. It's our fault. We stopped adding to our faith. Uh, you never stop eating and nourishing yourself your whole life, and you can't do that spiritually either because you're not going to get in a place where you can just kind of put it in cruise and just move on down the road and the devil never bother you. He bothers old people just like he does young people. Amen? Uh, but here in this passage of Scripture, he talks about the, uh, the believer's position. Now, we have a position in Jesus Christ, and 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, Therefore, if any man be 
in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He said if you're in Jesus Christ, there's no other way that you could be but a new creature. When he gets in you and you get in him and he gets in the Father, trust me, you're going to change. That's what Jesus preached about in John 14, 20. He said, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Uh, now look at that. He said, I am in my Father. He said, and ye in me. And he said, on top of that, I'm in you. And a threefold cord is not hardly broken. Amen. Look here, John believed in eternal security of the believer. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 20, he said, and we know. I like that statement. That's a man that is a sold out and for sure on what he believes. There's some things I know and you're wasting your time uh, to pull up and start talking to me about them. Amen. I know I'm right about them. I'll never change my mind. You know why? Because I can flip to the pages. I can point to it in context and say, this is why I'm saved forever. I was as crazy as a gnat in the yo-yo. People kept me worried to death and nervous and chewing on my nails and wondering, man, have I got it forever or do I just have it temporarily? And I just made up my mind. I'm going to find out what God said about it. I'm going to just study it and find out that truth myself. I can live every day. I can lay down every night. And if the whole world burns down tonight, I am going to be in heaven. Amen. And I know that. Thank God. And if you're saved, you ought to know that there's going to be some evangelist blow through here one day. And his mission is to get you to doubt your salvation so he can get you on the altar and convince himself that I've won another one. Amen. Now I take that to heart. I have a hard time with these guys. If you're saved, you will do this. I've heard them say everything and I'm thinking, well, I don't know about that. It's all right when a preacher says something. If you say, I don't know about that. There's a guy preaching in my prison the other day. And uh, when he got done, he said something in his sermon that I'd never heard. And I said, where did you get that? That's good. I've never heard that. Here was his answer. I don't know. I think I read it somewhere or I heard somebody say it. Don't ever preach that. Amen. <laughs> Don't ever preach that. Know what you're preaching. Talk about what you know and nothing else because if you talk about something you don't know like you know it, you are going to make a fool out of yourself. Amen. He said, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. Hey, we've got clear mental uh, perception of this thing here. He said that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true. Even in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the a true God and eternal life. Look, he gave me an understanding through what he taught me in this book that I have eternal life abiding in me right now. You know why? Because he is abiding in me. That's my position in Christ. I'm saved forever whether I like it or not, but I kind of like it. Amen? Amen. And if you're saved forever, you know what you're not going to do? You're not going to be a debtor to this flesh. We're not preaching you're saved and you can live any way you want. If you're saved, you will live any way you want. But you know what you'll want to do? You'll want to live for God. You'll want to you'll want to feed that spirit, man. You'll want to read the Bible. You'll want to go to church. You'll want to fellowship with God's people. You'll want to live right when nobody's looking. You'll want to act right at work. You'll want to act right at school. You'll always want to do right. You know why? Because that's what you are. Amen. But anyway, in Romans chapter 8 here in our text, I like this right here. I used to ask myself, how in the world can I still do wrong and be so right? Amen. And he answered it right here. Verse number 8 of Romans chapter 8, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're in the flesh, no matter how good you are, you're disgusting to him. He said, I, he said, I righteousness is as filthy rags. No matter how good you are, it's not good enough. If you are in the flesh and you're in the flesh, if you are not saved. 
You can't please God. Look here in verse 9. He said, but you're not in the flesh. He's talking to saved people here. How can we be in the flesh and not of the flesh? Ephesians 2, 1, he said, And you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. We were dead, but we're alive now in Christ. When he looks at your body, if you're not saved, he sees you as you are. You are a fleshly creature in need of salvation that has rejected Jesus Christ and the righteousness of God. You're like those Jews in uh, Romans 10. He said, I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. He said they're going about to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Hey friend, I'm telling you, when you submit yourself to the righteousness of God and say, look, I'm not good enough to go to heaven no matter how good I am. He will give you his righteousness and not your own. You ever run into that guy who says, I'm a good person. No, you're not. There's none good. No, not one. You know why? Because he sees you in the flesh. Amen. Now, the Bible talks about Barnabas being a good man. You know why Barnabas was a good man? Because what God put in him, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, goodness. Right. Right. The only be good in God's eyes is if God puts it in you. Right. But he said, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. God don't see me as I am. He sees me as how he's made me. He looked at that spiritual man. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He said if the Spirit of God is not in here, you do not belong to Jesus Christ. But thank God Almighty, when he looks at me, he looks at what he done on the inside of me. That is my position in Jesus Christ. I am what you call saved. Amen. The Bible said this when Jesus was dying on the cross in Matthew 27 and verse 42. He saved others himself he cannot save. Ain't that a blessing? If he had saved himself, all of us would be unsaved tonight. Do you know what the word saved means? You've heard it a lot. There's a lot of people here a word they never know the meaning of it. When you learn the meaning of that word, it's good. Amen. Saved means to keep safe and sound. I'm safe. I am of sound mind and body because I am saved. It means to rescue from danger and destruction. Thank God I was in the midst of danger and destruction. I was lost in my sin and on my way to hell, but He saved me. He gave me something that nobody else I could not obtain by myself, and I am safe in Jesus Christ tonight. I don't have to worry about it no more. He meant I'm saved. Look here, Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what he'll do? He'll save you too. He'll keep you safe and sound. You don't have to worry about it. Now, I have laid down before and thought, Now, I've got a little unconfessed sin. I need to talk to him about that. He said, Yes, you do. Amen? Amen? You like, look here. Your sin will find you out if you're saved. But he said, If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. But he said, If that Spirit dwell in you, he said, then you're in Christ. Verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. That's what I was talking about. When he looks at your flesh, he sees it as dead. And if Christ be in you, that's Christ the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 4, 12, Know you not that your body is the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. When he looks at you, he sees you as a spiritual man. He don't look at that flesh. It is dead to him. Amen. It's dead to him. Thank God I'm dead in the flesh and alive in the Spirit according to God. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Not only that, but he goes on to tell me that that same Spirit dwells in me is going to raise me up one day. That's my position in Christ. You can't change that. I'm saved. You know what? I'm not only saved, I'm sealed. You know, when you're sealed, that's a good thing too. I've got a godly seal on me. The king of heaven took his ring, and in that wax, he put, he's mine. And he said, he can't break that seal, you can't break that seal, I'm going to break that seal. The lion of the tribe of Judah, just like he broke that seal in Revelation, he'll be the one breaking that seal when I get to heaven. You know why? You know how he can break that seal in? He can trust us then. 
He can't trust whom he is right now too much. Amen. He knows what he can trust with. But we're sealed. That means to set a mark upon you. When you're sealed, that means he confirms what he said. He saved you. That means he places beyond any doubt that you're his. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 he said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of promise, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Look, we can grieve God, we can grieve the Holy Ghost by the way we conduct ourselves and the way we live on this planet. He said, But grieve him not, but look, I don't want to grieve God. He said, But you're sealed to when? The day of redemption. Amen. Ain't that good? That ought to help you sleep better tonight. He said, do you know what's going on with COVID? No, but if it kills me, I know where I'm going to go. I don't want to get COVID again. I don't want to get cancer again. I'm done with both of them. But if one of them don't kill me, something else will. But I know that I am in him and I am safe and secure. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.22 said, Who hath also sealed us and given us, us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know what earnest is? When you go buy a house, you put down a little earnest money on it. You know what God did? He gave us the damn payment of the Holy Spirit on the inside. And he said, That'll do till I get to see you holy and complete. Amen. Ain't that a blessing? I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to shout right now. Amen. That's my position in Christ. Amen. Somebody says, you call yourself a Christian. Yes, I do, because I am one. Amen. And yes, you did hear me say that, and I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Where's that boy I was going to accuse of cussing in Sunday school today? It was him. Yeah. He didn't cuss in Sunday school, so we ain't going to accuse him of it. Me and his little buddy got together and worked it up, but we would have been lying, so we didn't want to get in trouble with God either. Amen? He's a good kid. But look here. I'm saved, I'm sealed, and I am sanctified. You know what sanctified is? That means you're free from the guilt of sin. Look here. Sin, before I got saved, I was a guilty man. You know what? Guilt kills a lot of people. There's a lot of people who will take their own life today because of guilt. There's a lot of people, for whatever reason, their guilt is weighting them down so much that they cannot get through the day. You know, I tell people, I tell them boys in prison, some when you walk out that gate, hold your head up. Because the jury of your peers said you've got to do this. And if you do that, you've paid the debt that we said you had to pay. You don't have to feel guilty about it no more. Somebody says something to you. Say, look, I paid my debt. And can I tell you this? I'm sanctified. Jude verse 1 said, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother James to them that are sanctified by God, uh, the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. I am sanctified by God, not by myself. I am preserved in Jesus Christ, not in my own power. And he said, you are called. Amen. We've been called unto holiness, and we owe the flesh nothing. That's why we separate, because we want to, not because we have to. Some places you have to, and if you don't, you're in trouble. You know why some people's in church tonight, where they go to church at? Because their preacher told them, now look, if you violate this commandment, you know, you're scooting toward apostasy. And they can't tell you how far in apostasy you have to go, how many times you have to miss... But if you keep missing, eventually you're going to be back in apostasy. Look here. I wouldn't want to be nowhere else but tonight. Amen. Where I'm at. But anyway, I, I, that's an, but look here. Hebrews chapter 10. Just flip over there. Write this down if you can. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 14. For by one offering he hath perfected. Can I tell you? He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, there's an eternal sanctification. 
That's what I'm preaching about right now. There is a progressive eternal the sanctification, and that is one that you get up every day and you make up your mind, I'm going to live for God, no matter how I feel, no matter what the world's doing, and all my friends, look here, my position in Christ is I'm sanctified forever, but our progression in this world is to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and show the world that we're saved by the grace of God. But he said, we're perfected forever uh, 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 them that are sanctified when you're perfected that means you're complete that means you're accomplished there's nothing else that needs to be done for you to go to heaven got everything I need to go to heaven amen, amen. he just didn't give me everything I needed to live for God every day amen yeah. got to grow in grace I was a baby in Christ. Somebody said, look, you're making messes. I'm getting tired of cleaning them up. And they get you where you can walk. Quit all that yourself. Amen. Just like our babies, little children. Now, look, they're, they're guilty of things that I'm not guilty of. You know, because they're little children. And you just let them know, hey, you can't do that. And then sometimes you have to let them know you can't do that. Then become young men. It's like these young men and women in here. You know, they're 15, 20-year-old. And you know what? Uh, they ain't kids anymore. They're, they're, they're adults, kind of young adults, what we call them. You know, we throw them the keys to the car and say, hey, when you go over that hill, I hope that what I've taught you goes with you. Their first record speeding ticket will tell you they didn't listen. <laughs> you mean? So there you go. So be real careful there. But look here. You're supposed to be a father. You're a little bit more responsible and taking on responsibility and assured about some things can handle the pressure. Then you're an elder, you know, you're old and you can't do anything anymore, but give out advice. I'm longing for that day. <laughs> Amen. But I'm complete. That's my position. But look here, here's the believer's promises. You know, when God tells you something, when Jesus Christ tells you something, you can take it to the bank. Yes, sir. It is totally true. You know, there's some people said, you just need to be baptized in Jesus' name. I said, well, I don't know. Now, I know Jesus in Matthew 28 said, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I ain't never read where he changed his mind. So that's good enough for me. So you take that up with heaven. If you want to be baptized in Jesus only. But let me say, if you're baptized in Jesus only, that is the Trinity. That those people don't believe in. Amen. But anyway, I'm going to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I ain't going to dunk you three times. I'm just going to hold you down a little bit longer. Amen. <laughs> so all three of them get you. But anyway. But look here, the promise is that he made. Jesus preached it in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He told that to a preacher that was preaching. And by the way, John 3, 16, the first time it was ever preached, it wasn't preached to a prisoner out of jail. It was preached to a preacher by the name of Nicodemus. And he said, look, this man believed in the law that you had to keep the law to get into heaven. And he said, look, when you believe on the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. You don't have to trust all that stuff you're doing anymore. Right. Amen. Amen. Yep. And he said, how can this be about that born again business? He said in verse 10, you're a master in Israel. You don't know these things. You know what he's telling? Salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Another message another time. Now, Jesus said this in John 10, 27, my sheep, that'd be us. You messed me up, Jordan, thanks. I just heard him quote it, and I got messed up. Okay, that's why I always keep your Bible in front of it, because verses you've known forever, they leave you sometimes. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. And he said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Amen. That's what Jesus said. Now I'm going to throw it out here again. Everlasting. You know what that means? Never to cease. Bam. Pretty good, ain't it? See, I've studied Hebrew and Greek too. Everlasting means that. Guy preached one time where a friend of mine was at and said he, he preached on tongues shall cease. He said he talked 10 minutes about what the Greek meant on cease, and he said it literally means to stop. 
You know so much. <laughs> but anyway. John preached it. Jesus preached it. John preached it. 1 John 2, 25. And this is a promise that he had promised us even eternal life. Thank God Almighty. I can carry it to the bank. I know that Jesus said it. John said it. They put it down in black and white so Larry could read it. And I can tell you tonight that this is a promise that God tied us one to in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He's talking about eternal life before the world began. That's not Calvinism. That's omniscience. And that's another message another time. You can't cover all the bases in one sermon. I know I try, but I can't. <laughs> Amen. Look here, 1 John 5, 13. These things, these things right unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. He said it's right here in this book. If you're sitting around worried to death and scared all the time, you are condemning your own laziness because you will not read it. God left it for a record for you to read it. Amen. Let's open it up. See what he's got to say. If he told me, he'll tell you. Amen. There's some secrets God don't want to keep. You know, it's speaking in parables. He said, I don't want them people to see it. He don't hold them from us. Amen. But anyway, Jude preached it. Jude verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. Amen. Ain't that good? Faultless. You know you're not faultless. But he's going to keep you. He said, 1 Peter 1, 5, We are kept... By the power of self. We are kept by the power of God. There's no other greater, there's no greater power. Amen? Somebody says, well, faith without works is dead being alone. Yes, it is. That's true too. But you know what? James is not talking about the inward man. He's talking about the outward man. Because he talks about where comes wars and fightings among you. Do we ever fuss among ourselves? I think we do. Matter of fact, there's people that if they wouldn't have so much fuss and fighting, they'd still be in this church and not in another one. Amen? That's right. He said, your tongue. Did your tongue ever get loose on you? Well, I'll just tell you. I'll tell you right now what I know about them, and I'll just tell you right now. And I'll just tell you. Look, you tell everything you know. He said, no man can tame that tongue. God has to be the one that tames it. Amen. Amen. But anyway, man, I love this good. He says, look, you come down here in the church, and you pick you out the highest seat. He said, you know, you think you're important, and all of us do sometimes. We put our jackets on. We think we just, we think we're the man. Yeah. You know? But he said, somebody that comes in that's a little bit more important than you, they're going to come down and say, hey, buddy, you need to scoot. He's talking about the outward man, is what James is talking about. He knows we got that issue. He said, look, if there comes in a man in gay clothing, and you said him, say here, and the guy that's poor and he's not wearing the best of clothing, you sit over here and you move him. He knows our motive. That guy's got money. That guy's got good clothes. He knows that God's preachers and people have that problem. <laughs> that guy can do something for the church that that guy can't. Hey, he may secretly win the lottery because we all know he plays it, right? But anyway. We got the believer's protection, and I'm done. It's 7.15. You're going to get home soon. I'm just about done here. But in Colossians chapter 2, I want you to flip over there real quick. Colossians chapter 2. And this is, right, this is what said it for me. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 13. I like what he said in Colossians 2, 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He said, I've got all the treasures of wisdom, everything you need to know. See, knowledge is acquiring information. 
You know, some of these kids, they come out of school, and you know what? They've got a, a wealth of knowledge. They don't have wisdom. You know, a young doctor don't bother me. Or somebody that's young in a field, they're going, don't bother me. They've got, they're, they're privy to all the latest technology and all this knowledge. But what you need is you need a steady hand. Because, see, when you know a whole lot, you tend to, well, the Bible said knowledge puffeth up. That's why you got these old hands. They don't care if it's a school teacher or what. You come and share your knowledge to the world, nobody's really interested much. And that old guy, that old gal comes over and she says, hey, here's the way you deal with those people. They teach you how to treat people. Yeah, right. Amen. They know how, because see, they've been where you're at. But he said, in him are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then down in verse 9, he said, for in him, talking about Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why Jesus told, uh, he said, uh, who was it? It just left my mind. He said, how sayest thou? Yeah, Mr. Bible. <laughs> Uh, wow I just like that guy I messed up the song let's just move on amen <laughs> how can you say show us the father there he is he said how can you say show us the father he said well, if you have seen me you have seen the father he said when you're looking for God he said you're looking at him when you look at me he said he said in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily that's why I look here I want to throw this verse I read this verse one day and sometimes you read things and, and they just hit you and I'll get back to this in a minute Colossians but John chapter 3 and verse number 13 I love this verse I read it one day it's just like a light come on this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus he said and no man hath ascended up to heaven He's prophesying about later on down the road. I'm going to, I'm going to ascend. You know John 3.16 was a prophecy. He hadn't died yet. But anyway. But he that came down from heaven. He said nobody's ever ascended but he that came down. He said I'm the one that came down. He made that clear many places. Even the son of man which is in heaven. He said I'm right here. He said I've been there before. And he said I'm up there right now as well as right here. Now oh boy that's a real brain twister right there. Right. Try to figure out all of that. I ain't. I'm just going to believe what he said. He was here and there at the same time. That's omnipresence of God. But anyway in Colossians chapter uh, 2 and verse number 10. And you're complete in him. You know, when you're completing him, that means you have a fixed position in Christ and we need nothing else to make us a fit subject for heaven. Which is the head of all principality and power. And I'm going to throw this at you and I'm going to quit. And whom also you're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised us from the dead. You know what he said in verse 11 and verse 12? He said, there's an operation, there's a supernatural operation took place. He called it a circumcision, the cutting away of the flesh. That's what the sign was with Abraham, with, that he gave to Abraham. That circumcision, thing, the cutting away of the flesh. I view you different. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know what God does? He takes the scalpel of the Word of God and He cuts that spirit away from that soul and that body and He places a seal on it. So down deep inside of me, not the fleshly part, not the emotional part because that does affect our salvation sometimes. Some days we don't feel saved. Sometimes we feel so saved we can't contain our joy. Amen. And we shout and we run them down the aisle. But he said look, he said he took the word of God and said, uh, uh, cut that spirit away from that soul and body and put a seal on it and it's there to the day of redemption. And then he said we are buried with him in baptism. Let me say this about baptism. Ephesians 4 said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
The Bible talks about many baptisms. He said, he said there's only one true baptism, what he's saying. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. This is the baptism he's talking about here. He said you're baptizing him. And I don't know, but it just left me again. That's why I always keep your Bible in front of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13. For by one Spirit, we all are baptized into one body. Ephesians 4. That, that, that he said, whether we be Jews or Gentile, if you're not a Jew, by birth, you're a Gentile. He said, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink unto one Spirit. He said, we're all baptized into the body by one Spirit. I tell folks, when I got saved by the grace of God, I didn't understand everything that took place, but I knew that something happened on the inside of me. I didn't know that operation that took place. There was a baptism of the Holy Ghost. I told him I got baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of shouting, and I've been doing it ever since. You get saved by the grace of God. He baptizes you from the top of your head to the sole of your foot by the Holy Ghost of God into the body of Christ and you become one of His. Amen. You can't get no more in than that. Yes, Amen. But that's our promises and our protection. That's the believer's protection. The certificate of death in Roman law, if I read my history right, they, when they put them in prison, they would put a list beside their door of their crime so people could read their crime. And I think it was a red one. But either way, it meant he was guilty and they list him so everybody could see him. Now upon his release, he was given a yellow card. And it was called the Certificate of Debt and it read, paid in full. Now, they could read the red card, but when you got out of jail, when you got saved by the grace of God, baptized, into the body of Christ by the Holy Ghost of God. So I got the yellow card. Amen? Ain't that a blessing? And I don't know, I can't say the word to tell us, how he said. Heard a guy say it one time. I don't even know if that's Roman, Greek, or whatever. I, it, might, it might be Portuguese. I don't know. I can't even say Portuguese. It means paid in full. Amen? I've been paid for. Right. Amen? Yeah. If you own your house over here, it's paid for. You don't have to send a bank no more money. It's yours. You got a car out there in that parking lot paid for? It's yours. You don't owe by nothing. He said, I've been paid for in full. Can I tell you something? When I talk to people about this great doctrine, when I talk to them, I said, look, what more could you do than God himself coming down from heaven living a life here, giving us so many lessons that we can learn from. God himself coming down and dying on a cross, shedding God's blood. Amen? God's blood. I don't care what John, uh, or, uh, John MacArthur says, it was supernatural blood. It was God's blood. If God coming from heaven and God taking his blood, like I said, the first Hebrews nine twelve, into the holy place to obtain to obtain eternal redemption for us. If God doing that, taking His blood there, God Himself laying in the grave for three days, preaching to those spirits that were in prison. If God Himself coming down, dying for your sins, going to the throne room on your behalf to give you eternal redemption by his own power, raising himself from the dead. What else can you do that's going to make you say, I earned it? I don't want to be that haughty. I don't want to be that... I, look, you should never, ever be that proud of yourself. Ever. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lord, for the gift of eternal security. I pray this truth tonight that it was just preached would touch the hearts of the hearers. I pray that those who fear and worry about their heavenly Father looking for an opportunity to 
cast them away and take their probationary period from them. Lord, I, I pray for them tonight that their fears have been quietened. I pray for them tonight that they would learn this great truth and carry it in their hearts and realize, Lord, that our redemption is forever. Lord, I pray tonight a prayer of thanks, knowing that no matter what might come in the future, Lord, and I pray my future is good. I pray the future of these people are good, that they would live right and holy in their homes and in their hearts, and that you'd help us, Lord, to be that light that the world needs to see, that salt that the world needs to preserve it. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to walk circumspect in a dark world. Help us to do it. But, Lord, help us to rest in the fact that we're saved forever. We love you and thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all come on, do what you normally do. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.